Okay, speak. Chapter, First Amendment, second verse. Rebellion is in the air. We only have a week left before winter break. Students are getting away with murder and the staff is too worn out to care. I hear rumors of eggnog in the faculty lounge. The revolutionary spirit is even breaking out in social studies class. David Petrakis is fighting back about the freedom to speak thing. I get to class on time. I don't dare use a stolen late pass with Mr. Neck. David takes a seat in the front row and sets a tape recorder on his desk. As Mr. Neck opens his mouth to speak, David presses the play and record buttons at the same time like a pianist hitting an opening chord. Mr. Neck teaches the class straight. We are galloping toward the Revolutionary War. He writes, no taxation without representation on the board. Very cool rhyming slogan. Too bad they didn't have bumper stickers back then. The colonists wanted a voice in the British Parliament. No one in power would listen to their complaints. The lecture is going to sound great on the tape. Mr. Neck has prepared notes and everything. His voice is as smooth as a new poor road. No bumps. The tape will not be able to pick up the angry gleam in Mr. Neck's eyes though. He glares at David the whole time he's speaking. If a teacher stared murder at me for 48 minutes, I turn into a puddle of melted jello. David stares back. The school office is the best place to go for gossip. I overhear the soundbite about the Petrakis' lawyer while I wait for another lecture from my guidance counselor about not living up to my potential. How does she know what my potential is? Potential for what? When she talks, blah, blah. I usually count the dots in her ceiling tiles. The guidance counselor is late today, so I sit invisible in the red plastic chair while the secretary brings a PTA volunteer up to warp speed about the Petrakis thing. David's parents have hired a big, nasty, expensive lawyer. He is threatening to sue the school district and Mr. Neck for everything from incompetence to civil rights violations. David's tape recorder is allowed in class to document potential future violations. The secretary doesn't sound too upset at the idea that Mr. Neck could get canned. I bet she knows him personally. David must have mentioned the hairy eyeball treatment to his lawyer that afternoon because the next day there is a video camera set up in the back of the class. David Petrakis is my hero. Wombat's rule. I let Heather talk me into going to the winter assembly. She hates sitting alone almost as much as I do. The Marthas have not issued an imperial invitation for her to sit with them. She's bummed, but she tries not to show it. In perfect Martha style, she wears a green sweater with a huge Santa face on it, red leggings and fluffy boots. Too, too perfect. I refuse to wear anything seasonal. Heather gives me my Christmas present early, bell earrings that chime when I turn my head. This means I'll have to get her something. Maybe I'll go wholesome and buy a friendship necklace. She's the friendship necklace type. The bells are a great choice. I shake my head all through principal principal's speech to drown out his voice. The orchestra plays an unrecognizable tune. Heather says the school board won't let them perform Christmas carols or Hanukkah songs or Kwanzaa tunes. Instead of multicultural, we have no cultural. The high point of the assembly is the announcement of our new name and mascot. Principal Principal reads the vote total. Bees, three. Iceberg, 17. Hilltoppers, one. Wombats, 32. The other 1,547 votes were write-ins or ineligible. The Meriwether Wombats has a nice ring. We are wombats, woozy, wicked wombats, worried, withdrawn, weird, weird wombats. We pass Raven cheerleader and Amber cheerleader on the way to my bus. They wrinkle their brows as they struggle to rhyme wombat. Democracy is a wonderful institution. Winter break. School is out and there are two days until Christmas. Mom left a note saying I can put up the tree if I want. I drag the tree out of the basement and stain the driveway so I can sweep the dust and the cobwebs off it with a broom. I leave the lights on it from year to year. All I have to do is hang the ornaments. There is something about Christmas that requires a rug rat. Little kids make Christmas fun. I wonder if we could rent one for the holidays. When I was tiny, we would buy a real tree and stay up late night drinking hot chocolate and finding just the right place for the special decorations. It seems like my parents gave up the magic when I found out that Santa was a lie. Maybe I shouldn't have told them. 
I knew where the parents, where the presence really came from. It broke their hearts. I bet they'd be divorced by now if I hadn't been born. I'm sure I was a huge disappointment. I'm not pretty or smart or athletic. I'm just like them, an ordinary drone dressed in secrets and lies. I can't believe we have to keep play acting until I graduate. It's a shame we can't just admit we have failed family living, sell the house, split up the money and get on with our lives. Merry Christmas. I call Heather, but she's shopping. What would Heather do if she were here and the house didn't feel like Christmas? I'll, I will pretend to be Heather. I bundle up in a geeky snow clothes, wrap a scarf around my head and plunge into a snow drift. The backyard is gorgeous. The trees and bushes are all wrapped in ice, reflecting sunlight into something powerful. I just have to make a snow angel. I tromp to an unmarked piece of snow and let myself fall backward. The scarf falls over my mouth as I wave my wings. The wet wool seems like first grade. Walking to school on a cold morning with my milk money jangling in the tips of my mittens. We live in a different house then, a smaller house. Mom worked at the jewelry counter and was home after school. Dad had a nicer boss and talked all the time about buying a boat. I believed in Santa Claus. The wind stirs the branches overhead. My heart clangs like a fire bell. The scarf is too tight on my mouth. I pull it off to breathe. The moisture on my skin freezes. I wanna make a wish, but I don't know what to wish for. And I have to snow up my back. I break off branches and the, holy, and the holly bushes and a few springs of pine and carry them inside. I tie them together with red yarn and set them on the fireplace mantle and the dining room table. It doesn't look as nice as when the lady on TV did it, but it makes the place smell better. I still wish we could borrow a kid for a few days. We sleep until noon on Christmas. I give my mom a black sweater and dad a CD with 60s hits. They give me a handful of gift certificates, a TV for my room, ice skates, and a sketch pad with charcoal pencils. They say they have noticed me drawing. I almost tell them right then and there. Tears flood my eyes. They notice I've been trying to draw. They noticed. I try to swallow the snowball in my throat. This isn't going to be easy. I'm sure they suspect I was at the party. Maybe they even heard about me calling the cops. But I want to tell them everything as we sit there by our classic, by our plastic Christmas tree while Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer video plays. I wipe my eyes. They wait with unsure smiles. The snowball grows larger. When I snuck home that night, they weren't in the house. Both cars were gone. I was supposed to have been at Rachel's all night long. They weren't expecting me, that's for sure. I showered until the hot water was gone. Then I crawled in bed and did not sleep. Mom pulled in around 2 a.m. Da Dad just before sunup. They had not been together. What had they been doing? I thought I knew. How can I talk to them about that night? How can I start? Rudolph sets out on his ice flow. I'm independent, he declares. Dad looks at his watch. Mom stuffs the wrapping paper into a garbage bag. They leave the room. I'm still sitting on the floor holding the paper and charcoals. I didn't even say thank you. Hard labor. I had two days of freedom before my parents decided I wasn't going to lounge around the house all vacation. I have to go to work with them. I'm not legally old enough to work, but they don't care. I spend the weekend at mom's store, dealing with all the merchandise brought back by grumpy people. Did anyone in Syracuse get what they wanted for Christmas? Sure doesn't seem like it. Since I'm underage, mom sticks me in the base, basement stock room. I'm supposed to refold the shirts, sticking them with 11 pins. The other employees watch me like I'm a rat, like my mother had sent me to the basement to spy on them. I fold a few shirts, then kick back and take out a book. They relax. I'm one of them. I don't want to be there either. Mom obviously knows I did squat, but she doesn't say anything in the car. We don't leave until way after dark because she has so much work to do. Sales have sucked. She can't get anywhere near the goal she set. Layoffs are coming. We stop at a traffic light. Mom closes her eyes. Her skin is in a flat gray color, like underwear washed so many times it's about to fall apart. I feel bad that I didn't fold more shirts for her. The next day they send me to dad's. He sells some kind of insurance, but I don't know how or why. He sets up a card table for me in his, in his office. My job is to put calendars into envelopes. Seal them up and stick them on mailing labels. He sits, sits at his desk 
and talks to his buddies on the phone. He gets to work with his feet up. He gets to laugh with his friends on the phone. He gets to call out for lunch. I think he deserves to be in the basement folding shirts and helping my mother. I deserve to be watching cable or taking a nap or even going to Heather's house. By lunchtime, my stomach boils with anger. Dad's secretary says something nice to me when she drops off my lunch, but I don't answer her. I glare daggers at the back of my father's head. Angry, angry, angry. I have a million envelopes to close. I run my tongue over the gross, gummy envelope flap. The sharp edge of the flap cuts my tongue. I taste my blood. Its face suddenly pops up in my mind. All the anger whistles out of me like I'm a pop balloon. Dad is really pissed when he sees how many calendars I bled on. He mentions a need for professional help. I'm actually grateful to go back to school. Foul. Now that, there's now that there are two feet of snow on the ground, the phys ed teachers let us have class inside. They keep the gym at about 40 degrees because a little cool air never hurt anyone. Easy for them to say they wear sweatpants. The first inside sport is basketball. Miss Connors teaches us how to throw foul shots. I step up to the line, bounce the ball twice and put it through the net. Miss Connors tells me to do it again and again. She keeps bouncing balls my way, and I keep putting them up, swish, swish, swish. 42 shots later, my arms wobble and I miss one. By that time, the entire class is gathered around and is watching. Nicole is just almost bursting. You have to join the team, she shouts. Miss Connors, meet me back here during activity period. You are going places with that arm. Me says nothing. It is a sad and downtrodden Miss Connors who meets me three hours later. She holds my current grades by two fingers. D, C, B minus, D, C minus, C, A. No basketball team for me because the A was an art. So my GPA is a whopping 1.7. Miss Connors did not win a lacrosse championship by being demure or, or hesitant. She times me in wind sprints, then puts, then puts me back on the line to shoot. Miss Connors, try an outside shot bank, it off the board. Have you thought about a tutor? Nice shot. It's those Ds that are killing you. Try a layup that needs work. I could maybe do something about the social studies grade, but your English teacher is impossible. She hates sports. Do you have a hook shot? I just do what I'm told. If I feel like talking, I would explain that she couldn't pay me enough to play on her basketball team. All that running, sweating, getting knocked around by genetic mutants? I don't think so. Now, if basketball had a designed foul shooter, maybe I'd consider. The other team fouls you, you get to pay them back. Boom. But that's not the way it works in basketball or in life. 